all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Those are Jesus' words recorded in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Known as the Great Commission, they're Jesus' marching orders to local churches. And beloved, they're Jesus' marching orders to us today. Now, I wish that I could hit pause here and have all of us listen to Pastor Sam's uh, cross contacts from 2021 titled God's Heart for the Nations to demonstrate that God has always desired to save a people for himself from every tribe, tongue, and nation. But since we don't have time for that, and because it'd probably be a little weird if we did that, honestly, I instead just want to focus our attention back on Jesus' words. King Jesus, who possesses all authority, has given local churches a very clear mission. Make disciples. Where? Among all nations. How? By going and then baptizing and teaching those newly made disciples all that Jesus has commanded. And where does that teaching happen? Where is one taught to observe all that Jesus has commanded? In local churches. In local churches. So we see that Jesus instructs local churches to send members to make disciples and establish local churches among the nations. And with that, beloved, we're actually well on our way to drafting a biblical definition of missions. And here it is. A biblical definition of missions modified ever so slightly from a forthcoming Nine Marks book in an upcoming church-centered missions series. But here's the definition. Missions is the planting of local churches across significant linguistic, geographic, and or cultural barriers for the glory of God. Missions is the planting of local churches across significant linguistic, geographic, and or cultural barriers for the glory of God. The local church is both the launch pad and the end game of missions. It's local churches who are to be engaged in the work of planting other local churches among the nations for the glory of God. And that reality ought to shape our own missions priorities as a church. We want everything we do when it comes to missions to be centered around the local church, both in the preparation for missions and in the actual work of missions. Now, broadly speaking, there are two types of missions work that we're going to engage in. Church planting and church strengthening. Church planting and church strengthening. Church planting, of course, is establishing new local churches. This is Paul's ambition as articulated in Romans 15, 20 to 21. Thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Paul's ambition is to preach the gospel and plant churches where there are none. That's church planting when it comes to missions. Church strengthening, on the other hand, is the building up of existing local churches. Think of Titus 1.15 where Paul leaves Titus in Crete to put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town. 
a church already exists in Crete, and Paul leaves Titus there to rightly order the church, to help her become stronger and healthier. Or consider what Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. As I urged you, when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. Paul urges Timothy to remain at Ephesus to ensure the teaching of sound doctrine. And Timothy is one of Paul's very best. Paul is willing to devote one of his very best missionary partners to the task of church strengthening. Church strengthening is not small potatoes in the eyes of the Apostle Paul. And beloved, it's not small potatoes in our eyes either. And that's why, along with church planting, we're going to give ourselves to it. Church planting and church strengthening are the mission's priorities of the New Testament, and they're going to be our mission's priorities too. So now that we've established a quick, and I admit that was a very quick theological foundation for how we think about missions, here's what I want to do with the rest of our time. Essentially, what I want to do is share with you all that the elders have been thinking about surrounding missions over the course of the last four months. So please understand that this elder address is not primarily theological. It's intended by design to be highly practical. I want to fill you in on all that the elders have been thinking about. And there are four big ticket items that I want to talk about with you tonight. Global missions priorities, training and expectations, assessment and sending, and then I want to leave you with some encouragements to our church. So those are the four big ticket items. Global missions priorities, training and expectations, our assessment and sending process, and then some encouragements. So first, global missions priorities. As a church, we desire to be directly involved in the training, sending, and supporting of missionaries and other global workers in obedience to the Great Commission and for the glory of God. And I make that distinction between missionary and global worker intentionally. Not every global worker, not everyone that we send to engage in missions-related work is a missionary in the true sense of the word. We understand a missionary to be sent by a local church to cross against significant linguistic, geographic, and or cultural barriers to proclaim the gospel among other peoples with the goal of making disciples and establishing healthy local churches. That's what a missionary is. And we see the long-term local presence of missionaries within a culture as the most effective method for such proclamation. And so with that, here are the four priorities that will guide our decisions regarding the training, sending, and supporting of missionaries and other global workers who aid in this work. Here's the first priority, gospel proclamation. We understand the work of missions to prioritize evangelistic gospel proclamation that seeks personal conversion to Jesus Christ through faith. Second priority, healthy local churches. We view the goal of missions not merely to be the evangelization of individuals, but the planting and establishing of healthy, local, self-governing churches. And this necessarily involves the intentional training of godly leaders within the local church. Third priority, gospel access. While proclaiming the gospel and establishing churches is a valuable investment anywhere on the planet, 
we recognize an increased priority and urgency for areas and peoples who have limited or no access to the gospel or to healthy local churches. So we're going to prioritize the places where those things aren't existent or exist in very small ways. Fourth priority, strategic partnerships. We value global workers serving in teams alongside those who have a high degree of like-mindedness in ministry. We also believe that partnering with other like-minded local churches and missions agencies will increase our opportunities for effective missions efforts. And so we're going to prioritize sending and supporting members who plan to work with those who are previously sent out by Hunsinger Lane or those from sister churches with whom we're very like-minded, or other trusted missions partners. And we'll also prioritize sending and supporting those who will be engaging in pastoral work and those who are truly being sent as missionaries as previously defined. So those are the four main priorities that will guide our decisions about training, sending, and supporting missionaries and other global workers. Again, their gospel proclamation, healthy local churches, gospel access, and strategic partnerships. Now, having established those priorities, let's talk about what we're trying to accomplish in our missions training and some of our expectations for prospective global workers. As a church, we desire to train send and support global workers who demonstrate the kind of lives that we see held forth in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. So to that end, our missions training, which includes but is not limited to our missions cohort, is especially designed to help prospective global workers grow in three primary areas of life. Conviction, character, and competence. Conviction, character, and competence. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, our missions cohort is designed to lay a solid doctrinal foundation over the course of nine months. And it's designed so that a faithful member of the church with no previous formal theological training can participate in the missions cohort and then, along with being a faithful member, be ready to be sent overseas after completing it. So our missions cohort, along with even more importantly, faithful church membership, is our missions training ground. Faithful church membership is essential in our missions training, both in those desiring to go being faithful members and you as a faithful member discipling and helping those desiring to go. So through those things, we're aiming to help people grow again in our biblical conviction, godly character, and spirit-empowered competence. And I want to walk through each of those three things. First, biblical conviction. We desire to raise up leaders who can clearly articulate and defend biblical convictions. And so we want to provide training that will help individuals know and love God's word be exposed to systematic and biblical theology, and be able to clearly communicate these truths in understandable and applicable ways. You know, in order to become a member of this church, you have to be able to answer the question, what is the gospel? In order to be sent out by this church as a, prospect, as a missionary or a global worker, you need to be able to answer not just that question, but also the question, what is the church? If you're going to be sent to plant or strengthen a local church, you need to know inside and out what exactly a church is. So we want to sharpen you and hone your biblical convictions. Second, we want to help you grow in godly character. Not only do we want our global workers to know truth and doctrine, but we desire to raise up leaders whose lives have been deeply impacted by the truths of God's word. We understand that a life of godliness is not merely what people know, but how they live their lives because of what they know. Basically, we want our 
global workers to be people of godly character. And third, spirit-empowered competence. Along with conviction and character, we desire to raise up leaders who are competent and able to effectively engage in missions work. We know that God gives his people many different gifts, and while there are many well-meaning, good-intentioned people, it's clear according to scripture that God has not gifted us all in the same way. So we seek to come alongside members considering missions and help determine whether they're suited for a life of strategically advancing the Great Commission as a global worker. And to help with this, prospective global workers will be required to be actively involved in the life of the church and highly encouraged to engage in evangelism and discipleship, especially among internationals. And we'll also consider other areas of a prospective global workers' life, like their school performance, their job performance, life experience. And that's because we desire to see people effectively exercising their gifts and evidently both faithful and fruitful in ministry now and in the station of life God has them in now before they're sent to the field. Now we're also going to consider compatibility. We desire to send global workers with whom we don't just share a philosophy of ministry, but strong relational compatibility. Since we're committed to providing ongoing pastoral and relational support to our global workers, it's imperative that both our pastors and our members have a good relationship with whomever it is we're going to send to the field. It's also imperative that prospective global workers have a good relationship with both the local church on the ground and, if applicable, the team that they're going to be joining overseas. So uh, competency, conviction, character, all of those things are huge, but compatibility is also important. Those are the things that we're going to aim our training at. Now, if you're looking to be sent out of Hunsinger Lane, let me lay out for you some expectations that we would have for you as a church. Some expectations for those looking to be sent out as global workers. First and foremost, we expect you to model faithful membership, including a faithful ministry of presence on Sunday morning and Sunday evening like you all are doing now, regular discipleship in the life of the church, hospitality and other uh, service within the ordinary rhythms of church life. Faithful discipleship and ministry in the context of this church is necessary if you want to be sent out to make disciples in another context. So we expect you to model faithful membership. Second, we expect you to participate in our missions cohort. And if you're looking to be sent in an elder qualified role, we also expect you to complete our eldering internship. Third, we expect you to demonstrate effective service in cross-cultural ministry. This will not only provide you with exposure to various cultures, but the opportunity to test your effectiveness in cross-cultural ministry. And this might be as simple as opening up your home regularly to internationals, or volunteering with the Kentucky Racetrack Chaplaincy or Refuge International. But the bottom line is, if you're not engaging cross-culturally here, then chances are we're not going to send you to do that somewhere else. And fourth, we expect our church to really know you. If we don't know you, we're not going to send you. And the best way to be known by our church is to lean into our congregational life together and to do so for many years. So if you desire to be sent out by Hunsinger Lane, my exhortation to you, start doing those things. Okay. I know we've covered a lot so far. Take a breather here. And now let's talk about sending and assessment, our sending and assessment process. So imagine that You're desiring to be sent out by Hunsinger Lane as a global worker. What do you do? 
How do you get the ball rolling? Let me give you 10 steps, and they should be up on the screen here. Step one, talk to me or another elder as soon as possible. And it's, it's helpful for us to know that as we're getting to know you. Second step, sign an HLBC missions assessment agreement that basically indicates that you're willing to submit to our church's timeline to send you should we decide to do that. And at this point, you'll also uh, begin working on an elder or deacon questionnaire to help us determine whether you're qualified for the work you're desiring to do. We'll also ask you to submit a letter of interest to the elders. Step three, demonstrate faithful church membership in our body for at least a year. We want you to integrate into the life of the church before we begin to kind of formally train you in the upcoming ways I'm about to talk about, which is step four, participate in the missions cohort and if applicable, the eldering internship. Step five, when the elders think you're ready, they'll formally begin the global worker assessment process with you which looks a lot like our elder or deacon assessment process. I'm not going to get into all of the details there, but the only difference really is that we'll ask you to complete a global worker uh, questionnaire in addition to the elder or deacon questionnaire. And we'll also uh, likely ask some more questions of your spouse if you're married pertaining to missions. Step six, if the elders think you're qualified, then you and your uh, spouse, if applicable, will take a vision trip with an elder to visit the team that you're desiring to join. We want you to be able to see if you can really envision yourself there, get to know the team, get to know the work. Step seven, once a a team has been confirmed, we'll look to affirm you as a global worker, either by elder affirmation or congregational affirmation, which again would pretty much follow the same process as an elder or deacon nomination. So basically, if the work someone's going to do requires them to be elder qualified, or deacon qualified, then we're going to ask the congregation to affirm that they're indeed qualified to do the work we're sending them to do. But if the work only requires them to be a faithful church member, then that doesn't need to go before the congregation. The elders can determine whether someone indeed meets that qualification. So that'll just receive an elder affirmation. Step eight, once affirmed, either by the elders or by the congregation, you'll then complete the assessment process with your sending agency. And, and there's a little bit of flexibility here, but this is the normal process. We want to affirm someone before they begin the process with their sending agency. Step nine, and assuming that goes well, upon, upon signing our partnership agreement form, which is going to outline our partnership going forward, you'll be sent out of our church as a global worker. And then step 10, enjoy the ongoing partnership between you and the saints of Hunsinger Lane Baptist Church. So that's the process at a very high level. I want to now make a few comments. When it comes to assessing a prospective global worker, as already outlined, we certainly want to assess someone's convictions, character, competency, and compatibility. But we also want to evaluate how well someone's aspirations fit with the overall mission strategy and goals of Hunsinger Lane Baptist Church. So while we can commit as a church to raising up individuals for missions, we cannot commit to supporting everyone we send to the mission field in the same way. In fact, we can't even commit to supporting everyone who's qualified and desirous to go. You know, it may be that you're qualified and desirous to serve as an associate pastor of a church in Morocco, and the work we're most directly engaged in is in Malaysia, in the UAE. And in that case, we may not send you as one of our global workers, even though you're qualified for the work and the work that you're going to do is good work. And it's not because we don't love you. It's not because we don't think the work you'd be going to do is isn't valuable, it's simply because your aspirations don't align with our mission's priorities. We'd be happy for you to go, we're just not going to be the church to send you to do it. We don't want to spread ourselves too thin. Now, let me be super clear about this. Completing all of the elements of our mission's training, even if you're qualified for the work, 
And you desire to go does not necessarily mean that you'll be sent by Hunsinger Lane. Now, if you are sent by our church, I, I also want you to realize that the level of support you receive from us may differ from someone else who's also sent by our church. And with that in mind, I just want to paint for you a big picture for how we're going to consider sending members from our church to the mission field, the different capacities with which we're going to send folks to the field. And this uh, structure that I'm going to present isn't in the Bible, but it's based on biblical principles and one that we think is biblically wise. So let me kind of walk you through each of the different missions assessment outcomes. After you've gone through the assessment process, here are all the possibilities for how things may play out for you. You'll either get a red light, a yellow light, or a green light. Red light means stop. Here's who might get a red light. Someone who seems clearly unqualified or unfit for the work they're considering or for whom a move overseas seems clearly unwise. So our answer to sending an individual like this is no, or at least not yet. And if that individual attempted to be sent by another church or to kind of work independently with the sending agency apart from us, we would actually intervene and share our concerns with that church or that agency. So that's the red light. The yellow light means that we won't own you, but we won't stop you. Here's who might get the yellow light. Someone for whom there's no, t- no clear disqualification, but for varying reasons we choose not to own the individual. It might simply be that they desire to serve in a place where we don't have and don't plan to build strong partnerships. And if someone gets a yellow light, they're free to go to the mission field and or be sent by another church. We'd be happy for that to happen. We'd also be happy for that person to reconsider where they're willing to go and then to send them somewhere where we are engaged in work. And then there's the green light. The green light means go. And here's who's going to get the green light. Someone who's qualified and who's aspiring to do work that aligns in a place that aligns with our mission's strategy. And if someone gets the green light... So this is only true of individuals whom we deem to be qualified and who are looking to engage in work that aligns with and in a place that aligns with our mission's strategy. We'll send them in one of the following three capacities. Tier one, tier two, or tier three. Tier one individuals whom we call supported strategic workers will typically receive high relational support and high financial support. Tier two individuals whom we call supported workers will typically receive moderately high uh, relational support and moderate, moderate to no financial support. Moderate to no because if someone is sent through the IMB, they're fully funded, so we don't need to add any, any funds to someone's support as a church. Thus, thus the no portion of this spectrum. Tier three, individuals whom we call strategic global partners will receive moderate relational support and moderate to no financial support. And to set realistic expectations for those of you in this room who desire to be sent by our church to the mission field, the reality is most of you will probably fall in that tier two or tier three category. And that's simply because our church is only so big and only has so many resources And on top of all that, we, praise God, currently have 33 people interested in missions in our congregation. So just being realistic, there's really no way that we'd be able to send everyone with the same level of support. But if we do send you, we as a church want to care really well for you. We want to send you to the field well and care for you on the field well. And our care will vary a bit from tier to tier, but generally speaking, we want to do things like invite you to regular Zoom calls, send pastors and members to visit you on the field. We want to support special targeted projects you might be engaged in as our resources allow. We want to recruit people to join the work that you're doing. We want to pray regularly for you as a church on Sunday morning, Sunday evening, 
put you in the membership directory so members can pray for you on their own. And we want to house you while you come back to the States. So we want to care for you well. So again, here's a kind of 10,000 foot view of the three tiers. Tier one, supported strategic, strategic worker, lots of relational support, and lots of financial support. Typically, this will be a man who's either the main preaching pastor of a church or a highly strategic associate pastor. For example, someone who's running a pastoral internship with pastors and aspiring pastors from the 1040 window. So if you were to kind of think of Hunsinger Lane as a triple A uh, roadside service, here's what we want to do for that tier one person. We want to uh, basically give them a car and then give them 24-7 roadside service. Again, we're going to provide significant funding and significant relational support. Then the tier two supported worker, we want to give lots of relational support and moderate to no financial support. So typically this is a man or woman whose work is directly connected to the local church or who's investing most of their time language learning, discipling, and evangelizing. So going back to that AAA comparison, we want to provide our tier two workers with 24-7 roadside service. We'll provide, again, no to moderate funding, but significant relational support. And then there's the tier three strategic global partner, where we'll give moderate relational support and moderate to no financial support. So typically, this is a man or woman whose work is contributing to the missions ecosystem. So, for example, we're sending Forrest Strickland as a Tier 3 strategic global partner to serve as a faculty member of Gulf Theological Seminary. The work that he's doing is going to be contributing to the missions ecosystem, um, and so his work is slotting into that Tier 3 category. Basically, we want to put some gas in the tank of our Tier 3 supported workers. Again, we'll provide no to moderate funding, which may be ongoing or time limited, and some relational support. Now, please note that all of this, kind of discerning where someone might fall within those three categories, takes a lot of wisdom. You know, we can't just put someone into a calculator, punch some buttons, and then see what tear spits out. You know, figuring all of this out takes a lot of wisdom and is ultimately a case-by-case basis. So these are, this is a a structure, it's not perfect, but it's going to serve as a a good uh, kind of principle and, uh, and framework for us to think through and approach things. And a lot of this also depends on uh, the funding that we have available at the time that someone is ready to go to the field. You know, as a church, again, we have limited resources, and that's going to impact what we're able to do. So with all of that, let me just share with you a little bit about our missions ambitions for the coming years. Our goal is uh, to really own certain regions of the world. So by the end of this upcoming spring, the elders hope to identify a tier one strategic global worker whom we can begin to support and who can serve as a center of gravity for us to be able to send people to. So starting out, we want to identify, you know, two regions of the world or so where we can really begin to focus on supporting the good work happening there and then get to work sending our people there. And Lord willing, our soon-to-be partnership with ACME will be a big help with that because it's going to connect us to a bunch of super like-minded churches with whom we can partner in carrying out the Great Commission. Uh, Reaching and Teaching, who many of you are familiar with, A like-minded sending agency is also going to be a key partner of ours, though we'll also look to send through other organizations like like the IMB, but reaching and teaching will kind of be a key partner for us. Um, I hope all of that makes sense. I know it's a lot. There is going to be time for a QA and a over the potluck, Uh, but to close, I just want to now leave you with a few encouragements as a church. I want to give some encouragements to those who are considering going, and then I want to give an encouragement to those of you who intend to stay. So first, some encouragements to those of you who are considering going. First, if you're interested in going to the mission field, please make your interest known to me 
or to another elder as soon as possible. You know, this is helpful for us to have in our back pocket as we're getting to know you. Second, if you, des- if you desire to be sent by Hunsinger Lane, you're going to want to plan to be here for at least two, but probably more like three or four or even five years so that we can really get to know you. And if we don't know you, again, we're not going to send you. It's quite simple. This church sending you is a huge investment. And I'm not just talking financially, but in terms of time and relationship. Assessing and training takes time. Ongoing care takes time. You know, we're not going to be a church that just sends people to the mission field and then exchanges Christmas cards and leaves it at that. No, we're going to seek to care well for our global workers, both while they're overseas and while they're back in the States. So we really want to know you if we're going to invest in you like that. Third, make it your ambition to be a faithful member of this church. If you're not a faithful member here, we're not going to send you to do that elsewhere. Endeavor to be such a faithful member that we can't wait to send you. Fourth, Start engaging in cross-cultural evangelism and discipleship here in Louisville. Again, if you're not doing that faithfully here, chances are we're not going to send you to do that somewhere else. Fifth, if you came to Louisville because you were sent by another church, maintain a good relationship with that church. It may be that you decide to be sent by that church or that you end up receiving significant financial support from that church. So maintain a good relationship with the church that sent you here, if that's true of you. Sixth, participate in a future missions cohort. And seventh, know that we're not in a rush to send any of you. The Great Commission is urgent, but it's not frantic. We want to prepare you well. Our goal isn't to send as many people as possible, but to send qualified people who are prepared to do the work really, really well. So those are my encouragements to those of you who are looking to go. Now a final encouragement to those of you who intend to stay. To fulfill the Great Commission, we need people to go, but we also need people to stay. We need Apostle Paul's And we need Gaius's. We need people who are willing to be sent and people who are willing to send them and care for them and pray for them as they go. The prayer of the elders is that many people in this church would get a vision to go and then go. And as we so regularly pray, uh, we pray that our efforts to raise up more elders would result in more missionaries being sent out from our church. But we also pray that many people in this church would get a vision to stay. And by that, I don't mean stay here in the U.S., but stay here at Hunsinger Lane Baptist Church, gathering with these saints every Sunday on Summerfield Drive. Because in order to send, we need people to stay. Rockets need rocket fuel. So brothers and sisters, may many of you go, and may many of you stay for the joy of the nations, and for the glory of God. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that you would delight to use our little church to make the nations glad and sing for joy. We so badly desire for the peoples to praise you, O God. We desire for all the peoples, people from every tribe, tongue, and nation to praise you. So would you delight to use us unto that end? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.